Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar to discuss uh, how to manage student loans during periods of unemployment or underemployment, uh, or just in general, quite frankly. Um, I'm delighted that you're here. I'm delighted to be able to present this webinar to you. Uh, this is a big thank you goes out to the Cape Cod Foundation, who has uh, generously sponsored this entire series of webinars and the program and help and has helped to sponsor the program that allows my organization to offer free student loan advice and dispute resolution. I also want to thank um, Mass Hire on the Cape for agreeing to partner with us to be able to offer this series um, and this program uh, to uh, residents of, of Cape Cod that may be experiencing underemployment or unemployment and allowing us the vehicle to be able to reach them. Um, this seminar is going to run a good hour. Um, I do encourage questions. I will ask. We have a nice small group today. Um, we are recording it uh, to make sure that this can go out um, and reach as many other Cape Cod residents as possible that may need the information. So I'm going to try to navigate the Q&A at least during the main part of the presentation to the chat panel. So, <clears throat> excuse me, every once in a while, I'm going to take a breath and see if we have questions in the chat panel. Um, I do encourage you not to share any personal information because, again, this is uh, the chat panel is public and this seminar is being recorded and will go out to hopefully lots and lots of others. So general questions are best. If you do have personal questions, you can always reach out to my organization, which is uh, the Institute of Student Loan Advisors or TISLA. Our uh, email, I'm sorry, our website is at the end of this presentation. Um, and we offer free student loan advice to anybody and everybody that needs it. You just need to email us through our contact page. Uh, we offer, um, we answer 99.999% of our emails within a business day. So again, if you have a question that gets a little too personal, I would strongly advise you to send it to us in an email through our website. So just a little bit more about TISLA and myself. Um, my name is Betsy Mayon. I am the president and founder of the Institute of Student Loan Advisors. I've been working in the student loan industry in a compliance and advocacy role for almost 25 years now. Um, at the end of 2017, I left my job to found TISLA because I realized that there were a lot of student loan borrowers that were looking for help. And unfortunately, a lot of times they were be they became victims of scams uh, that were prevalent at the time and unfortunately are still prevalent now. So I realized that consumers needed a, a place they could go that was neutral, meaning the people giving the information had zero interest in their loans um, and made sure that it was uh, the advice that was given by experts and was given in plain English. Um, we're a really small shop, but despite how small we are, um, all the staff and volunteers at TISLA put together have well over 50 years of experience um, in student loan servicing, in policy and regulations and legislation. So um, without further ado, I'm going to dive right in. Um, I'm going to dive right into our material. So. I think I mentioned, I, I did mention already in, in my introduction that I've been in the student loan industry, it feels like since the earth cooled. Um, I can tell you that what's been going on with student loans the last 18 months um, is nothing that I've ever seen before. Um, I've been through my fair share of national disasters um, while in the student loan industry, 9-11, Hurricane Katrina, the California wildfires, and I've certainly seen relief uh, offered to student loan borrowers during those times of crisis, but nothing compared to the relief that's being offered borrowers now, which I think is wonderful and needed. Um, but that those op those relief options are coming to an end, um, likely as of May first. So the first thing I'm going to do is talk about the relief that's out there. And then talk about how to manage our manage our loans once that relief is gone or if that relief didn't apply to you in the first place. So the vast majority of federal student loans 
were eligible for what I call the COVID waivers. Those COVID waivers went into effect March 13th of 2020. Um, and if your loan was eligible for those waivers, that means that you haven't been due for payment since March 13th. And even better, you're getting charged 0% interest. So the loans that were eligible for the waivers are what we call federal direct student loans, which those could be Stafford loans, Graduate Plus, Parent Plus, or Consolidation. Um, and that includes defaulted uh, federal direct loans as well. There's also a really small portion of federal loans under other federal programs. Um, back before 2010, and this is where things can get really confusing. Back before 2010, there were two main federal student loan programs. There was the Federal Direct Program and the Federal Family Education Loan Program, or the FEL. Now, both of those programs were exactly the same, except where they were different. Both had Stafford loans, both have Graduate Plus, both have Parent Plus, both have consolidations. Since 2000, so in 2010, Congress got rid of the FEL program. And that what that meant was that no new FEL loans would be made. So after 2010, except for a very tiny population of Perkins loans, which is also a federal program, all um, federal student loans made fell under the direct loan program. But if you have loans that were made before 2010, figuring out whether you have a FEL or a direct loan can be really hard to do because again, they both have Stafford, they both have Graduate Plus, they both have Parent Plus, and they both have consolidations. And unfortunately, as I mentioned a second ago, while all direct loans are eligible for the COVID waivers, only a very small percentage of Fell and Perkins loans, essentially th those loans that have been sold back to the Department of Education are eligible for these waivers. So if you have a Fell or Perkins loan and you're not sure whether your, your loans are eligible for the waivers, I mean, at this point, you likely have gotten a bill at some point or many bills at some point between since March of 2020. Um, but the other way to tell is if you log on to your account and see whether your interest rate is zero or not. If your interest rate right now is showing zero, then your loans are currently eligible for the waivers. So again, COVID waivers, if all federal direct loans, a very tiny percentage of lucky fell or Perkins borrowers, and that includes defaulted loans. Not eligible loans are the vast majority of fell. Um, unless they're in default, we'll talk about that in a second, in the vast majority of Perkins loans. State loans, such as the Mass No Interest Loan, institutional loans, which are loans that you would have borrowed directly from the institution, that tends to be more common with for-profit colleges, and private loans. None of those are eligible for the COVID waivers. Now, one thing, one last thing I want to mention is that if you do have a Fell or a Perkins loan, you actually can consolidate that into the direct loan program to make them eligible for the waivers. Um, we're doing another webinar specifically about the pros and cons of consolidation and refinancing next month. Um, so if that's something that you're interested in, you want, you'll want to keep an eye out for that flyer and make sure that you sign up for that, for that webinar as well. Um, as I mentioned already, um, only federal, what we call federally held um, federal student loans are eligible for the waivers. And a federally held federal student loan is a direct loan or that tiny portion of FEL loans um, that has been purchased or given to the Department of Education over the years for various reasons. Same for Perkins loans. We're starting to see more and more Perkins loans become what we call federally held and therefore eligible for the waivers. Um, and that's because they are phasing out the Perkins loan program and the schools are starting to slowly move what's left of their portfolio directly over to the Department of Education. All right, so the, the COVID-19 waivers, uh, as I mentioned, they started on March 13th of 2020. As of right this second, they're due to end on May 1st of this year. Um, there's some chatter that they could be further extended. Um, I am of the opinion that you should plan for the worst and hope for the best as far as that extension goes. Normally, I would say there's no way in heck that they're ever going to extend this any further. But there's a lot of politics going on with these waivers and student loans in general. And with the midterms coming up and depending on what's going on with the economy, 
and depending on what's happening with how successful the Biden administration is in getting the reconciliation bills passed and Build Back Better Act, it's not impossible that they would extend this waiver beyond May 1st. But as of right now, there's no indication that they're going to. So we're going to run on the assumption that uh, all student loans will be back in repayment as of May of 2022. <clears throat> if your loans were eligible for the waivers, you have not been charged any interest um, since March 13th. If your loans were delinquent on March 13th, they've been brought current. Um, now, if they were in default, those loans are still in default. But if you were, say, 90 days past due or 120 days past due, as long as you weren't over 270 days past due and outright in default, then your loans have been brought uh, into a current status. And when you get your first bill in May, you're, you'll be showing zero days past due and in good standing. You haven't been due for payment since March 13th. Um, if you are someone who's been pursuing public service loan forgiveness, or forgiveness under an income driven plan, um, this period of time, they treat it like you were in repayment and making payments on time. So assuming that you've been meeting all the other eligibility requirements for these programs, um, which as an aside, we are doing a webinar specifically on public service loan forgiveness um, in, this is February, uh, at the end of March, we're doing one on public service loan forgiveness. So if that's something you're interested in, I recommend you sign up for that webinar as well. But anyway, this waiver period, assuming you meet all the other criteria, even though you haven't been making payments, they count like you were making payments for the purposes of these forgiveness programs. Um, normally when you put loans on hold, whether it be for forbearance, which this waiver is technically a forbearance or a deferment, or you've been in school, um, any outstanding interest is added onto the principal at the end of it in the form of capitalization. Uh, Congress made sure when they created the COVID uh, relief program for student loans that it would not result in interest capitalizing. The other really nice thing is they also wanted to make sure that there was not some unintended consequences to this waiver. So they specifically wrote into it that even though you're not due for payment and you and you haven't been making payments, your credit report reflects that you are actually in repayment and in good standing. So when I, you know, going back to what I said a minute ago, the type of relief that's being offered borrowers during this particular crisis is just way beyond anything that we have seen in the past. And I definitely think it was needed. So if you're still not sure whether your loan was eligible for the waivers or not, the first thing to do is, if you know it's a federal loan, was that loan made on or after July 1st, 2010? If it was, then it's a direct loan and 100% is, is getting the COVID waivers. Um, if it was made um, before 2010, check the interest rate. If it shows 0%, then you're absolutely getting the waivers. The, if it's listed as a direct loan, it's absolutely getting the waivers. If it's not listed as a direct loan, you're not sure what the interest rate is and it was made before 2010, you can log on to the Department of Education's website, which is studentaid.gov, and look at your list of loans and look at the column where it tells you who the lender is. If the lender says Department of Education, then it is considered a federally held federal student loan and is eligible for these COVID waivers. So this, this is gonna apply more to the, those of you that have these Fell or Perkins loans and are trying to determine if you were one of the lucky 20% or so um, whose loans were made eligible for those waivers. Now, if you don't have loans that were eligible for the COVID waivers, the relief was, uh, <coughs> it was out there um, but it varied depending on your loan. Now, if you had a Feller or Perkins loan that wasn't eligible for the waivers, um, most servicers, if you became delinquent, were automatically going to put a, what we call a disaster forbearance on the account. Now, that is the typical relief historically that's been offered borrowers that were struggling due to some sort of disaster or national economic crisis. Um, those disaster forbearances are nowhere near as generous as the COVID waivers. I mean, 
They're important because it's better than defaulting on your loan, which has enormous uh, financial and economic consequences, but interest still accrues while you're in disaster forbearance. Um, the disaster forbearance tends to only last for about 90 days, although they were allowing for extensions during the COVID period, but not two year extensions, which is what the COVID waivers were. Um, so again, better than nothing, um, cause it prevents default, but nowhere near as generous as the COVID waivers were. Um, if you had a 90 day disaster forbearance put on your account and you were still able to make payments, you could absolutely, they would notify you by mail or email or whatever contact information they had for you. And you can absolutely ask for it to be removed because remember at the end of a forbearance, any outstanding interest is added onto the principal in the form of capitalization. So if you could afford to make the payments and didn't need this disaster forbearance, then you should absolutely ask for it to be removed. Um, and just to reiterate, if your loans were eligible for the COVID waivers, this isn't anything you have to worry about. It's only if you had federal loans that were not eligible for the COVID waivers that you would, you would wanna look into this. And of course you could always continue to make payments either during the disaster forbearance if one was placed on your account, or if no forbearance was placed on your account, then you would be required um, to make payments. Now, private and other non-federal loans, so your state loans, your institutional loans, pri the private loan programs varied. I saw some private loan programs, uh, particularly if they were with a credit union, that they automatically, at least you know, back in March of 2020, provided some relief. Um, I saw one credit union that lowered everybody's interest rate to like 2% for a little while and put payments on hold. But then I saw the other end of the spectrum where the private loan programs didn't offer any relief. Um, and that's one of the issues with private student loans is they often don't offer any forms of relief if there's a financial crisis, which is unfortunate. Um, some did, if you called and asked for it, some offered some short forbearances, like 30, 60, maybe 90 days. Some of them had, some of them actually charged a fee for that forbearance. So I had borrowers that reached out to Tisla where they were being offered a forbearance while they had been laid off during COVID, but they were being charged $50 per loan on each of their private loans for this 90 day forbearance, which is, Unfortunate, but again, is one of the reasons that I try to steal, steer people away from private loans as much as possible. Um, now, the irony of private student loans is that once you are past due, they will actually off, you often have more opportunities for relief. Some, a lot of private loan programs will offer interest only payments for a year. Um, or uh, so every once in a while, I do see one that will base a payment based on income but it's only if you're a delinquent. It's very much like if you remember the mortgage crisis back in uh, 2008, they, uh, they had mortgage relief programs, but you had to be past due in order to be able to take advantage of them. And that tends to be what happens with private student loans. Um, to be fair to the private lenders, who a lot of us love to hate, um, a lot of the reasons that they don't offer options for relief well, before you fall past due is because they're not allowed to from their from their regulators. Um, <clears throat> as far as institutional loans go, so loans made directly through the school and that are owed directly to the school, again, the options vary depending on the institution. Um, the, so because all of these programs vary, in fact, even within a single lender, you can have multiple private student loan programs that have completely different rules. The best advice I can give you is that if you're struggling with your private student loans, to give your uh, loan holder a call and see what they might be offering in the form of COVID relief, um, if anything. Um, I have someone who's asking, will the slideshow be shared with participants after the webinar? We are going to um, make a recording available that has the slides on it. I'm sorry that you're having um, internet issues. Hopefully that will be resolved, uh, but we will be making a recording available to Cape Cod residents. Okay, so let's talk about managing your loans 
uh, post waiver. So the first thing is to make sure you know where your loans are. And I know that sounds like a kind of a duh, but the other thing that this been, a, I mentioned to you that the last 18 months um, of all my years in the student loan industry, the last 18 months have just been the craziest I've ever seen. There's so many things going on. Not the least of them is that there's been a, a lot of really enormous changes in who is servicing the federal student loan. We've had a lot of long time, big student loan servicers leaving or have left in the last 18 months. Navient, AKA Sally May, um, is the biggest one. They actually didn't even wait for their contract to end. They just sort of said, we're done. We want out of the pool. And they transferred the rest of their contract to a new Department of Education vendor called Maximus. Um, their student loan arm is called Aid Advantage. Um, more locally, um, a longtime student loan player um, up in New Hampshire called Granite State. They're also called NEF, uh, the New Hampshire Higher Education uh, Foundation. I forget what all the letters mean. I apologize. But Granite State was their servicing arm. They let their contract lapse and their loans have been transferred. Um, if you're someone that's pursuing public service loan forgiveness, you're very familiar and your loans are probably with an organization called Fed Loan Servicing. They're also known as FIA. Uh, they're out of Pennsylvania and they're another enormous longtime player in the student loan industry. And their contract was due to expire at the end of 2021. And they announced they weren't renewing. Um, and the Department of Education convinced them to extend their contract by one more year. But we recently uh, found out that their loans, all their PSLF loans anyway, um, are going to be transferred to a company called Mohila. Um, some of their rest of their portfolio is going to, you know, for people that aren't pursuing PSLF, those loans are going to a company called Ed Financial, both long term uh, participants in the student loan servicing industry. So when I say the first step is finding your loans, um, it's not as ridiculous as it sounds because there are loans that have moved. Now, if you aren't sure who is holding your federal student loans, the easiest thing to do is to log on to the Department of Education's website, which again is studentaid.gov. Any federal student loan you've ever had is gonna be listed there. Um, now, keep in mind that studentaid.gov is an awesome resource, but it's not real time. What it will tell you is who's holding your loans, what kind of loans you have, what school those loans were for, um, what status they're currently in, and your approximate balance. Now remember, this isn't real time. It only gets updated anywhere between every couple of weeks to once a month. So you definitely don't want to use that as um, a, a, you know, a real time measure of what your loan status is or what your balance is. Um, but it is a good place to sort of get a basic idea of your loans. The other th nice thing about studentaid.gov is the Department of Ed will actually the, the Biden administration as a whole, they're trying to make uh, make as many sort of one-stop servicing portals as possible for consumers. So now on studentaid.gov, you can actually consolidate your loans, apply for certain repayment plans rather than having to then go to your servicer. But again, studentaid.gov is, it should be your first stop to make sure you know who's currently holding all your loans. Now, if you have private loans or institutional loans or state loans, you're going to have to check your, either your credit report or, especially if you're a recent graduate, you will have received what's called exit counseling materials. And those exit counseling materials will also list all your loans on them and who at least at that moment the current loan holder was. Okay, so let's talk about what your options are if you know we get to May and whether you're employed or unemployed or underemployed or just struggling financially, what your options are. Now, um, one of your options is to continue to postpone your payments through a tool called deferment. There's also another tool called forbearance that we're gonna talk about in a minute. Now, deferment, um, if you have to postpone your payments altogether, deferment tends to be uh, more preferable than forbearances. And the reason is, is that if you have 
subsidized loans, which those would be Stafford loans. Not all Stafford loans are subsidized, um, but some, some Stafford loans are. That means that while you're in deferment, no additional interest is going to accrue on your loans. Whereas if you have unsubsidized Stafford loans um, or PLUS loans, whether they be parent PLUS loans or graduate PLUS loans, interest is going to accrue no matter what. Um, the other, deferments are given for very specific reasons. So um, we're going to cover some of the more common deferments in a minute, but that's another big difference between a deferment and forbearance. Uh, deferment, you have to have a very specific reason, whereas forbearance, um, you generally don't have to, you can just claim financial hardship and they'll, and they'll give you the forbearance. Now, while that sounds easier, and in some ways, especially if you don't have a lot of subsidized loans, would make you think forbearance is preferable, it really isn't because there is a limit to how much deferment and forbearance time you can have over your lifetime. And you want to keep, forbearance should be a last resort um, no matter what. For one, um, remember interest accrues on all loans during forbearance, which where will only accrue on some of your loans during deferment. <coughs> but also forbearance can be a great Hail Mary pass. So if, if the reason you are unable to pay your loans is not a reason that would make you eligible for a deferment and a lower payment option isn't going to help you, you want to maintain that limited forbearance eligibility so at least you have that option available to you. One example that I see comes up, well, two examples that come up a lot with the borrowers that reach out to me are people that have uh, extensive medical bills. There's no deferment for that. And there's no, when they, none of the payment options look at your other expenses. So forbearance if can be a way to help you in that situation. Another common occurrence I see is all of a sudden there's a, a big car repair bill. Again, there's no deferment for that. There's nothing to take expenses into account. So you want to maintain that forbearance as a just in case sort of life preserver um, if life sends you a financial left hook. Now, uh, getting back to sort of general deferment eligibility, um, you are expected once you're no longer, the condition that puts you in the deferment no longer exists, you are expected to notify your servicer as soon as you're not eligible for the deferment anymore. I know that may seem counterintuitive. Sometimes it's tempting to give yourself a little more breathing room. Um, and, you know, they're not going to call and check, to, to be honest with you. However, remember, there's limited deferment time available to you. So in case you fall under that situation again in the future, you want to maintain as many months as you can of your deferment eligibility. Now, if you're one of the few people that have what we call a spousal or joint consolidation, which those have not been allowed since 2006, but there are about six or 800,000 couples out there that do have a spousal consolidation. If, if you happen to have one of those, both spouses within the consolidation have to be eligible for the deferment to be able to get the deferment. It doesn't have to be the same deferment, but you both have to be eligible for one in order to get it. If your loans are in default or over 270 days past due, you're not going to be able to get a deferment. Um, it, but if you're otherwise eligible for it, that is your right. So your loan holder cannot refuse to give you the deferment if you still have deferment time available and you're eligible for it and you're not over 270 days past due. Forbearance is at the loan holder's discretion. They rarely do say no, but they can say no. But again, a deferment is absolutely your right as a federal student loan borrower. Um, deferments can be used in rare occasions to reverse default. This isn't as common anymore because the data exchange has improved so much. But back in the day, it used to be fairly common where we would see people that defaulted on their loans and it turns out they were in school um, during the period that they were showing delinquent and for whatever reason their enrollment information had never made it to the servicer so we were able to use um, the prior eligibility for in-school deferment to reverse the default again not as common anymore but not impossible if you were actually eligible for deferment um, and had done what you needed to do to raise your hand to let the servicer know you were eligible for the deferment and you still defaulted it's possible that you could reverse the default and the consequences of default. 
<clears throat> so let's talk about some specific def uh, deferments. By far the most commonly used deferment is the unemployment deferment. Now you don't actually have to be not working at all to be eligible for this. To be eligible for the unemployment deferment, you need to be working less than 30 hours a week and actively seeking full-time work. Now, Fell loans, direct loans, and Perkins loans are all eligible for this as long as they're not in default at, at the time. Um, you can get a total of up to 36 months per borrower, um, and you uh, would get the deferment for six months at a time. Now, to apply for it, you need to submit what's called the unemployment deferment form. And you can find that form on my website, uh, which is freestudentloanadvice.org, the Department of Ed's website, which is studentaid.org, on the on your services website by logging in, or call the servicer, they'll mail you one if you want to go old school. But the easiest thing to do is just log on to your services website, download the form, fill it out, and then upload it back to your servicer. So that's the fastest um, and cleanest way to do it. Now, in order to be eligible for unemployment deferment, you have to submit proof that you're either receiving unemployment benefits or complete that unemployment deferment form. Now, for the first six months that you're on unemployment deferment, you just need to show that you're registered with an unemployment agency. You don't have to be receiving benefits. You can just be registered um, with Mass Hire, and you would, assuming you're working less than 30 hours a week and actively seeking full-time work, that's all you need to do to be eligible for the deferment. Now, if you get subsequent back-to-back -back unemployment deferments, the next, the second one that you get and any further ones you get, you also have to verify that you have, that you are, um, have applied to at least six places in the last six months for full-time work. And you also have to certify that you are not just applying um, within a single field, that you are applying for jobs um, or willing to accept jobs outside your field. Um, the detailed information that you have to supply for that piece these days is a lot less onerous than it used to be. Um, you used to actually have to give the information, including a contact person's name for all six places. The form doesn't require that much detail anymore, but you do still have to certify that you've done this. The next most commonly used deferment is the economic hardship deferment. This one's a little more complicated. Um, um, whether you have a federal fell loan, a direct loan, or a Perkins loan, again, all of these are eligible. You can get this one for 12 months at a time for a total of 36 months per borrower. Um, now, you do have to meet one of the following criteria. You either have to be receiving some sort of financially based federal or state public assistance. So that they mean food stamps, um, the state uh, health insurance programs are eligible for this, SSI, uh, state public assistance. If you're receiving any of those, then you would be eligible for the economic hardship deferment. Or if you're working full time and your monthly income is not more than minimum wage or 150% of the poverty guideline that's applicable to the state, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and your family size. Either one of those <coughs> would make you eligible for the economic hardship deferment. Now, to apply for this, you would uh, submit the economic hardship form that, you, again, you can get from my website, studentaid.gov, logging onto your servicer's website and downloading it or calling and asking for one over the phone. Um, and then you have to submit whichever uh, bullet point you're applying under, you have to submit proof of that. So if you're if you're applying because you're receiving some sort of federal or state public assistance, you would submit proof of what that public assistance was. If you were um, applying because of your income, then you would submit pay stubs or your most recent W-2. There's um, instructions for that on the form. Now, if you're one of the few people these days who has federal loans at multiple loan servicers, and one of your loan servicer already has you at an economic deferment, hardship deferment, all you need to send to the other loan servicer is the letter saying that you've been approved for the economic hardship deferment at the other servicer. They don't make, make you send the form to multiple places anymore. 
Um, now, those are the two primary deferments that are available for anybody who took their, there's other, there's other ones out there. We have them all listed on our website and they're all listed on studentaid.gov. For example, if you're in some sort of job rehabilitation or uh, alcohol or drug rehabilitation program, there's a deferment for that. If you're in a fellowship, there's a deferment for that. Um, those aren't as frequently used. Now, if you have loans that were taken out before 1993, there's actually dozens of other deferments available to you. Um, I just for for time's sake and for clarity's sake, I chose to just go into detail of the two most common, which again are unemployment or economic hardship, but check out those resources for other opportunities for deferment. And if you have questions, you can absolutely send them to us. Um, the last deferment I wanted to mention is in school deferment. So if you're in school at least half time and half time is determined by the school, then you're actually automatically going to be put into this in school deferment. You shouldn't have to do anything. The school is required to report your enrollment status to the Department of Ed. The Department of Ed in turn sends that enrollment status to all the loan holders. And if you're at least half time, excuse me, they'll put you in this in school deferment. Now, if you have parent plus loans, um, you only get the deferment while either the student for whom you took the loan is in school at least half time, or if you yourself are in school at least half time, you can put the loans on hold. Uh, but that's only if you have loans uh, for parent plus, they've gone back and forth on this. Um, if your loans, parent plus loans were taken out after 2008, you can defer while the student's in school, or if it's older from 93 to 97, you can, but if it was taken out between 97 and 2008, you can only defer it based on your own enrollment. Okay, we've talked a lot about forbearance already, but as I mentioned before, forbearance is sort of a last resort, Hail Mary, if there's no other option that will, that will prevent you from going delinquent or, or going into default. Now, as opposed to deferments, so deferment, remember, there's a limited amount of time. So for unemployment deferment and economic hardship, it's 36 months per borrower. Um, forbearance time is actually based on the loan. So, for example, if you went to undergrad, <clears throat> then went into repayment and used a year of forbearance, then went back to school and took out graduate loans, your undergrad loans would still have two years of discretionary forbearance left available to them and your um, graduate loans would have three. Um, but if if we change that from deferment to say unemployment deferment, in that example, your undergrad loans um, and your graduate loans would all still only have two years of defer unemployment deferment left available to them because deferments are based on the borrower's borrower and forbearance is based on the loan. Um, on a forbearance, the interest is going to accrue on all your loans, whether you have subsidized loans or not. And if you choose not to pay that interest while you're in the forbearance, um, it's going to be added on to the principal in the form of loan capitalization. That's the other reason I don't like. Um, I would prefer to see borrowers get into a lower payment plan, even if it's a zero dollar plan, than use a deferment and forbearance because most people tend not to pay the interest while they're in deferment and forbearance. And when it's capitalized, first of all, you're getting charged interest off of interest. Second of all, it's making your balance higher, which is probably going to translate into a higher payment. So um, again, these should just be used as a last resort. Most forbearances, the most common forbearance, we call a discretionary forbearance. That's the one where you would initiate, you would contact the loan holder. Sometimes you can even do it by text. Um, and say, you know, I'm, I'm financially struggling. They're not going to ask you any questions. They're not going to ask for any proof. Um, and they will usually put the loan in uh, forbearance for 12 months at a time, although you can ask for that to be reduced to just a month or two um, if you don't need it for that entire time. Um, and again, uh, at the end of it, interest is, is going to capitalize. Now, there are some other forbearances that are used behind the scenes and can be placed on the account without your consent. Um, there's actually dozens of reasons that this can happen. The most common would be, let's say, um, let's say you were 90 days past due 
and you submitted an unemployment deferment, but your period of unemployment and therefore your eligibility for the deferment didn't start till this month, they would start the deferment this month and use administrative forbearance to cover the three months that you were delinquent leading up to the deferment. Um, another common reason they use forbearance behind the scenes is if you're on um, an income-based repayment plan and you fail to recertify your income on time, they use administrative forbearance to make sure you don't go delinquent. Um, we talked about discretionary forbearance. I'm going to take a breath to see how we're doing with questions. I don't see any in the chat panel, but I'm going to give it a minute to see if we have questions about the deferments and forbearances before we move on to repayment options. Okay, quiet group. Oh, there's one other forbearance that a lot of people don't know about. Um, and again, I would only use this as an absolute last resort. That's uh, called the Title IV Excessive Debt Forbearance. I certainly don't expect you to remember that. Um, I would actually go so far as to say there might be a lot of um, student loan call center reps that may not be immediately f familiar with this, but it exists. It's a real thing. And if there's nothing else out there for you, you've used all your forbearance, you're not eligible or have used all your deferment, lower payment option isn't going to help you. Uh, this could be an absolute Hail Mary rather than defaulting. Um, <clears throat> this You're eligible for this if your student loan payments in total are more than 20% of your gross monthly income. This you can get for 12 months at a time for a total of 36 months per loan. You do have to submit proof of income to get it. Um, there may or may not be a form that varies by servicer. So let's talk about repayment plans. Now listen, the name of the game overall for your student loan strategy, I don't care what your situation is, um, the name of the game is paying the least amount over time. Now for some people that might mean pursuing a loan forgiveness program, um, for others, that might mean paying their loans off as aggressively as possible. But I say this to this, you know, if you're in a situation where you're in financial crisis, uh, maybe you're unemployed, maybe you're underemployed, it can be really tempting to immediately go with completely pausing the payments altogether and using deferment or forbearance. But remember, as we discussed, that's almost certainly going to end up with capitalized interest. And really, it could dramatically increase the cost of the loan over time. Um, so if, if there's any way that you can afford a lower payment option, even if it's just $5 a month, that can make an enormous difference towards paying the least amount over time, so to speak. Now, there's two types of payment plans for federal student loans. There's some that are based on the balance, and there's some that's based on your income. What you have in front of you right now are the ones that are based on the balance. Now, if you go into repayment and you don't consolidate and you don't pick another plan, they're going to put you in what's called the 10-year standard plan. That tends to be the plan that results in you paying the least amount of interest and paying the least amount over time. So under that plan, you're going to pay around the same amount every single month um, until the loan's paid off, which unless your balance is super low, is going to be over 120 payments or 10 years. There's the graduated repayment, which is sort of self-explanatory. You do interest only for the first two or four years, and then the payments gradually increase, but you still pay the loan off within 10 years. Extended repayment is for people that owe at least 30 grand in federal loans. Then they extend the term to 25 years. You're still paying around the same amount every, uh, same amount every month, um, but instead of having 10 years to pay it back, you have 25. That can also be achieved through loan consolidation, which actually can extend the term to 30 years. And then there's the graduated extended, which again is sort of self-explanatory. It extends your term to 25 years, but the first four years are going to be interest only. And again, you have to owe at least 30000 Now, any of these plans except the 10-year standard also apply to federal consolidation loans. So you can consolidate your loan and still get graduated repayment, for example. Now, the plans in front of you now are based on your income. Now, 
whether you want a plan that's based on your income versus a plan that's not based on your income, you know, at a high level, if your student loan debt is a lot lower than your annual income, then what's going to give you the low and you're looking to get the lowest payment possible because you're in financial crisis, you're probably going to want to go, you're probably going to find that the plans that are not based on income are going to give you the lowest payment. But if your income is low in comparison to what your student loan balance is, then chances are the income driven repayment plans are going to give you the lowest payment as opposed um, as opposed to the ones that are based on your balance. Now, listen, I'm going to be the first to say um, that these income driven plans are, can be really, really confusing. Um, <laughs> they're exactly the same, except where they're different. That insult to injury is actually two different plans that are called income based or payment that have completely different terms. So they have the exact same name, but completely different terms. Um, I don't, you know, they. They all have their own little nuances that can make them more or less attractive, depending on what your situation is. There are um, tools out there to help you compare these all these plans side by side. Um, the sort of low hanging fruit as far as those tools go is what's called the loan simulator and that's at studentaid.gov. You just plug in your information once and it'll give you all the plans um, that you're eligible for what the monthly payment amount will be, and more importantly, the estimate of what you would pay over time if you were to stay on that plan for the life of the loan. So I strongly recommend that you all check out that tool. We have a very similar tool on our website. Um, I would like to think that our tool is a little easier to utilize than the Department of Ed's, but um, there are some pros and cons to each, each of the tool on our site versus the tool at the Department of Ed site. Um, so in general, what these income driven plans do is they take a percentage of your discretionary income, which I'm going to define that in a second, it's either 10 or 15%, depending on the plan. Um, and that becomes your payment amount. And if you stay on that payment plan or a combination of these income driven plans for either 20 or 25 years, if you still have a balance at the end of 20 or 25 years, it's going to be forgiven. Now, if you're someone that's pursuing public service loan forgiveness, you need to get on one of these plans anyway. And, and for public service loan forgiveness purposes, they actually forgive after 10 years instead of the 20 or, or 25. Um, discretionary income is what they do is they take 150% of whatever the poverty line is for your family size and state, and they subtract that from um they subtract that from your agi your adjusted gross income and then they take either 10 or 15 percent of the remainder of that divided by 12 um, and that becomes what your payment is under these income driven plans most of the plans um, allow you most all of the plans will also use your spouse's income if you file your taxes as married um, with the exception of repay uh, the repay plan um, if you file your taxes as married finally separately, they will only look at your income. For repay, they'll actually look at your income regardless of your, your spouse's income regardless of your tax filing status. I want to make sure to emphasize if you have parent plus loans, um, it's kind of a catch 22. If you have parent plus loans, technically parent plus loans are not eligible for any of these income driven plans. However, there's a loophole where if you consolidate, then you can get access, get the parent plus loans access to the income contingent repayment plan only. I mentioned those calculators. Here's an example of the output. Um, so in this scenario, the borrower has $80,000 in federal student loans, and they have um, an annual income of um, I think it's uh, 90, I think I inputted $90,000. They have a family size of two. So as you, so this is what would show up as an output for that loan simulator tool, as well as for the tool on our site. So as you can see, the way to pay the least amount over time, um, also, oh, this borrower also works for a PSLF qualifying employer. 
So for this borrower, the way to pay the least amount over time is to get on the pay as you earn or the new IBR plan. Their monthly payment is $714 a month. They end up paying $103,000 out of pocket um, and they get around $12,000 forgiven. Um, if they weren't working for eligible PSLF employment, the way to pay the least amount over time would be the 10 year standard plan. They pay $921 a month and um, they pay a, to a total back of 110,000. If they were in financial crisis and they needed the lowest payment possible, um, then obviously they'd want extended graduated or perhaps the graduated repayment plan. <clears throat> um, you can switch plans whenever you like, um, no less than uh, every 12 months or if your income dramatically changes, you don't have to stay on the same plan uh, the whole time, even for the forgiveness components for the income driven plans. Um, you can also pay extra whenever you like. The quicker you pay the loan off, the least amount of interest you're going to pay. Um, sometimes even an extra $5 a month can make an enormous difference with how, how much you pay out of pocket. I mean, look at this example. This borrower with who borrowed 80000 if they take the full 10 years to pay it off, they're going to pay 40, um, sorry, 30 grand in interest. If they paid it off in five years, they could cut the amount of interest in half, most likely. Now for private loans, um, unfortunately, there are not as many options. We sort of talked about this already. Um, there tends not to be any lower payment options. At best, they're going to offer you forbearance and sometimes they're going to charge you a fee for that if you're struggling. There's another often another factor with private loans, though, and that's a cosigner. Cosigners on private student loans are equally liable for the debt. So if you are struggling financially and you know you're not going to be able to make your private loan payment, no matter how uncomfortable it is, you need to loop your cosigner in. And no matter how much they don't want to, if they don't want their own credit at risk, they need to help you with those payments. That's what they signed on for to be a cosigner. Now, it is possible to perhaps lower your payment um, and possible to release your cosigner from liability by refinancing your private loan. Unfortunately, the people that get approved for refinancing and especially the people that get approved for the best deals in refinancing their private loans tend not to be the ones that need it the most. So if you can't afford your private loan payment, um, then chances are your debt to income ratio isn't what the private loan refinancing companies that give the best deals are looking for. Um, the people that get the best deals refinancing are the ones that they have a good credit score, they have a good debt to income ratio, and they've got a couple of years of on-time payment under their belt. Now, if you're struggling, that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. You could end up with a lower interest rate, even if you still need a cosigner to get the refinance. But just to set expectations, um, they are there. It can be difficult if you're already struggling to get a refinance on your private loan. Um, if you fail to pay your private loan, they can go after you in court um, and get a judgment against you, which can and, and your cosigner for that matter, which can mean wage garnishment, bank account garnishment, etc. The good news is that they're going after you in court is expensive. So in my experience, if you stay in contact with the private loan lender um, and at least try to show good faith and pay something, they tend they will. They will tend to be more likely to help you, maybe even offer you a settlement, um, and less likely to go the court route. Um, I see we have a question here. It's about PSLF, so I'm going to hang on to that one till the end. <coughs> okay. So consolidation, um, you know, back in the early 2000s, everybody was told to consolidate and that was really, really good advice at the time. The reason for that is up until 2006, most federal student loans were given a variable interest rate and that interest rate changed every July 1st, depending on what the treasury bills look like. And back in the early 2000s, 
the interest rates got crazy, crazy, crazy low for federal student loans. And the way to lock in this crazy low interest rate was to consolidate. So again, back in the early 2000s, everybody and their brother was told to consolidate, and that was awesome advice. That advice has lingered to now, and it's not that consolidating your federal student loan is bad advice now. It's not bad advice most of the time. It's just not necessary most of the time. Um, that's because, again, since 2006, federal student loan interest rates have been fixed interest rates, and a federal consolidation does not change your interest rate. In fact, it could increase it by a tiny percent. The only people that really need to cons consider consolidating their federal student loans within the federal loan program are your parent plus borrowers who need to get access to that income contingent repayment plan, uh, borrowers who have those old Perkins or fell loans that need access to um, the more generous income driven plans or public service loan forgiveness. Excuse me, consolidation can also be used to get out of default. The um, best place or really the only place to consolidate is at studentaid.gov. Consolidation is always free. Um, one of the first indications that you are working with a student loan scammer is if they immediately suggest consolidation without asking you any questions and they charge a fee for it because consolidation is super easy to do yourself and it's always free to do. Now I do get a lot of borrowers that want to get a lower interest rate on their federal student loans so they want to consolidate their loans out of the federal student loan program and into the private loan program. Now keep in mind that I I've been doing this for a long time. I've seen all the financial left hooks that life can do to good people. Um, so again, I'm super financially, financially conservative. Um, I almost never, ever, ever recommend people consolidate their federal student loans out of the federal program and into the private, even if that means a drastically reduced interest rate. And the reason for that is that it, once you do that, you you no longer have access to any of the federal options for relief. No more deferments, no more forbearances, no more lower payment options. If something really bad happens, like you pass away or become permanently disabled, those discharges are not available to are most likely not available to you anymore. Um, the COVID waivers. I had so many borrowers who had um, regret because they had refinanced their federal loans out of the private loan program. And now they couldn't get the COVID waivers. They couldn't get the 0% interest rate. They were made redundant over COVID and they couldn't get an unemployment deferment. Um, and there's no take backsies. Um, once you do it, that's it. There's absolutely no way to get the loan back under the federal student loan program. Now, <clears throat> I meant, I've mentioned a couple times that the relief that we saw with the COVID waivers is like nothing I've ever seen before. However, I, the getting everything, getting the machine running again, I think is gonna, I hope I'm wrong, um, but we're looking at 42 million borrowers all re-entering repayment at exactly the same time. Now I know the Department of Ed and the loan servicers have been working really, really hard to make this as a smooth of a transition as possible. But let's be honest, you can't staff for this. Um, so I'm fully expecting that once the waivers are over, that consumers like you can expect very long call wait times and it to take longer for them to process paperwork for things like deferments, lower payment options, et cetera. So I strongly encourage you, if you feel like, you know, to get your student loan strategy in place um, no later than the beginning of April, and get any paperwork in that you need to get in by the middle of April. So you are, um, if I'm right, and I hope I'm wrong, but if I'm right and that there is a, a long wait time um, that you aren't affected by it. The best way to prepare, first, make sure that your loan holder has all your current contact information. Um, that way, if your loan changes status or if there's an update, or if you need to submit paperwork for recertification of your income driven plan, you know where they know where to find you. Uh, determine what your payment is gonna be once the waivers are over 
and then submit any applications that you need to submit. I, I need to update this slide. I had the end of December when it was supposed to be the end of January, but now I would do it by the beginning of April. And listen, I am as guilty of not opening my mail as everybody else is. But um, between now and when the waiver, and for a few months after the waivers are lifted, open all the things. Uh, there is going to be a lot of really important information coming your way. So you want to open the snail mail, the email, the owl, the carrier pigeon, however it comes to you, get in the habit of opening all your student loan related mail. And as I mentioned, be really wary of scams. Um, if you come across something you think is a scam, I strongly advise that you report it to the Federal Trade Commission at FTC.gov. They're doing a really good job of cracking down on these scams, as is the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau. But to be honest, it's like whack-a-mole. Um, they prosecute two of them, get them out of business, run them out of town, and three more pop up. So when in doubt, um, look for the phone number on your bill or on correspondence directly from your servicer and call that number. <coughs> Don't respond um, to anything. You know, if it, if it seems too good to be true, it almost certainly is. So I finished right at one. Um, here's some resources for you. This recording um, will be made available. I'm not sure exactly where yet, but we'll make sure that we get you that information. And I have time to hang out um, if people have um, if people have questions. We can actually you can take yourself off mute. We can try that since our group is on the smaller side um, for questions that people have. For the person that had the PSLF question, question was: I am on PSLF program, but typically work seasonal positions. This means I don't have consistent employment with the same employer or consistent income how to keep track of my PSLF payments. Um, so the best thing you can do is for every month that you're working full time for a PSLF eligible employer, make sure you're submitting your proof of eligible employment with the PSLF form. So if you, um, um, if you say are working for the Department of Public Works, for the summer of 2022, um, say from May to September, then you would, at the end of September, you would submit proof of that employment um, from May to September. Um, and you wanna make sure that you're on an eligible repayment plan. So for PSLF, that generally means an income driven plan. Now, if your income goes down, you could always recertify your income driven plan um, <coughs> and they'll readjust your payment based on your new income. Um, so that's the best way to handle if you're a seasonal, seasonable employee. It's going to mean a little more paperwork for you, um, than someone who doesn't have a seasonal job, but that's the best way to keep track. And yes, I will be emailing the slide deck to, um, Martha, I'll send that to you. Other questions. I gave you, for anyone who was feeling a little overwhelmed, I don't, I don't blame you. Um, I essentially gave you 20 years of information in an hour. Um, the purpose of this wasn't for you to remember all of this. The purpose was so that you know, you knew that these options were out there. And more importantly, you knew where to go for further information. So again, if you have questions, part of this program we're doing, um, through the grant from the Cape Cod Foundation is offering um, free student loan advice. So you go to our website, freestudentloanadvice.org, check out the plain English information on all of these options right there on the site. You don't have to log in. You don't have to supply any information. And then if you still have questions, go to our contact page and email us through the TISLA, um, the TISLA email address. Um, this other information, if you want information about the COVID waivers, we actually partnered with another nonprofit called Mapping Your Future. And this information, not only for student loan borrowers, but for people that are in school now or are about to go to college at studentaidpandemic.org. That's also a completely free site, as is studentaid.gov, which of course is the Department of Education's website as well. And FTC, 
again, I encourage you to report any scams that you might come across. Not seeing any more questions. Um, yeah, so for the person that is working towards PSLF, <coughs> supplying proof of eligible employment is always retroactive. Technically, you don't have to supply proof of eligible employment until you hit 120 eligible payments. That's just a terrible idea because you don't know for a fact that your employment's eligible and won't get them to count your payments until you start submitting the, the, proof, of, the proof of employment. So yeah, it's always retroactive. You can go back 15 years if that's, if that's the proof of employment that you have. All right, I'm going to stop the recording.